Well, today we conclude our wonderment around the fruit of the spirit of faithfulness. And today we look at the faithfulness asked of us through the law, the covenantal law that God gives through Moses and the prophets and Jesus himself. What does a faithful life look like in regards to what the Lord expects of us? And we ask this question taking into account the two passages in the Gospel of Matthew that I will uh, read. First, the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount regarding his understanding and relationship to the law. And then, of course, the great story of Palm Sunday and Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. First, then, from Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Jesus speaks and says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, the great palm Sunday story. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt tied with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them and sat on them. And the very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when he had entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. By your grace and through your mercy, we pray, O Lord, that you will allow these words to come to point to the word just read and to the word made flesh in Jesus the Christ, for we pray this in his name. Amen. Mr. Holland's Opus, a movie that came out about 25 years ago and may make it someday into the ranks of God and Hollywood, tells the story about Glenn Holland, a musician and composer who, in the effort to provide some financial stability for his family, reluctantly takes a job as a music teacher at a nearby high school, a temporary lull, he hopes, in his pursuit to become a famous composer. He ends up teaching, though, at this high school for 30 years. Mr. Holland's life is music. He plays it, he writes it, he performs it, he teaches it. And with every passing day, he sees that his life is being given over more and more to awakening the joy of music in his students. Overall, he meets with moderate success, and like most teachers, Mr. Holland has to contend with a wide spectrum of students, those who are there for the love of the subject, for the magic of music and the joy and beauty of it all, all the way over to those who are there for the bare minimum, whatever it takes to pass the class, those who raise their hand and ask, do we have to know this for the test? When you're a teacher, you know that you haven't quite broken through if the question is, do we have to know this for the test? Ironically, of course, in the movie, it turns out that Mr. Holland's only child is born deaf. He's not able to hear and participate in the core of his father's life. 
Mr. Holland's life is the sound of music and his son's life is void of such sound. And as a result, Mr. Holland pulls away from his son out of frustration and bitterness of not being able to share in the way that he wants to this most important part of his life. He half-heartedly learns sign language and makes little effort to create, be creative in his communication with his boy. The father and son grow further apart. And what Mr. Holland doesn't realize during it all is that he's the student who's being tested. His boy is the teacher demanding of him another language. But dad wants to get by with the minimum. Finally, but finally comes the moment when the music teacher father discovers that life is more than the minimum. Love is more than the minimum. So the old dog learns a new trick, learns himself a new language, and the two start doing life together. Do we have to know this for the test? I suppose to some degree or another, it is this question of what do we have to know for the test that has been at the heart of those living their lives in relationship with God? What does the Lord require of me? What's going to be on the test? Ever since God called Abraham and Sarah to the land of Canaan to begin a covenantal family, ever since God called Moses to deliver the people of Israel from Egypt and in the wilderness to receive the law, ever since the prophets began their prophetic preaching, the question that often gets asked from the back of the classroom is, how much of this do we have to know that's going to be on the test? In other words, of the 613 separate and distinct laws in the Old Testament, which one of them do we really have to know? Which one of them do I really have to get right? It was most certainly the debate in Jesus' day, the ongoing debate between the schools of legal scholars. Which part of the law do you have to have pinned down? It's what led the rich young ruler to come to Jesus and ask, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's going to be on the test, Jesus? You don't have to read too much between the lines of the Gospels to sense that Jesus' heart sinking a little bit lower and lower each time that question gets asked because he knows that they're missing the point. Jesus isn't teaching for the test. Jesus isn't schooling for the SATs. Jesus isn't interested in the bare minimum. Jesus is inviting them into the abundant life, not the minimum life. Jesus is seeking to fulfill the law, not scale down the law. And it is this fulfilling of the law that's the adventure. It is this fulfilling of the law that has Jesus up on top of the Mount of Olives. It is this fulfilling of the law that has Jesus leading the parade into Jerusalem. God is faithful in giving us the law, and now Jesus is faithful in showing us how to fulfill the law. And the fulfilling of the law, the righteousness that exceeds the scribes and Pharisees, has always been for Jesus this long obedience in the same direction. This long obedience in the same direction, to borrow a phrase that Eugene Peterson borrowed from Frederick Nietzsche, this long obedience in the same direction. And for Jesus, the long obedience in the same direction is the long obedience of love. Whatever direction Jesus takes, it's always in the direction of love. Whenever he's asked about the law, he weaves the conversation in the direction of love. When he saddles up his donkey on Palm Sunday, he is headed in the direction of love. And here's the thing. Love knows no minimum. Love does not study just for the test. Love, like music, is a contagion that you either catch or don't catch. Jesus parades into the city because he can do no other. He is on his way to the cross because he can do no other. He is teaching a new language to God's children because he can do no other. Love knows no minimum. It makes me think of the story I read a while ago about Detective Skip Manane up in Poughkeepsie, New York. 
Detective Manane had gotten the call concerning a hit and run accident in the city. Jaime Tenorio was a Mexican migrant worker in the area who cut lawns on the side and sent the bulk of his money back to his poor family, eking out an existence in a poor Mexican village in the middle of nowhere. That night, Jaime was riding his bike through the streets of Poughkeepsie and was struck and killed by a hit and run driver. After concluding the investigation and apprehending the perpetrator, Detective Manane did, did what it said to do in the police manual. He placed the obligatory phone, obligatory phone call to Jaime's widow in Mexico, who needed to be summoned to the only phone in the village in order to speak with him. Detective Manane informed her that her husband had been killed and asked if he should bury his body in the pauper's grave in Poughkeepsie like they do all the other migrant workers who die there. No, Mrs. Tornorio said. She wished his body to be sent back. Well, I'm so sorry, the detective said, but unless you can come up with the money, we can't do that. The widow begged and asked if there was anything the detective could do. It's not my job, he replied, and shortly after hung up the phone. But despite hanging up the phone, that woman kept speaking speaking to his mind and heart. She kept speaking to Detective Manane. He kept hearing that plea, those tears, her grief, the anguish that this man she loved, who was trying just to support his family, was going to be rolled into a pauper's grave a million miles away. It's not my job, he told her. Well, maybe it is. Maybe love has no minimum, so Detective Manane went to the priest of the local Hispanic congregation and asked if they could pass a hat on Sunday morning to raise a little money so this poor widow and her four children could have the dignity of burying her, their husband and father in their own village. Well, that priest got talking to some other priests, and the hat got passed in a bunch of churches, and the word got out to the local paper, which ran an article, and all of a sudden, envelopes full of money came from all over the area. And before you know it, Detective Manane, sitting at his desk at police headquarters, staring at envelopes with money that totaled $22,000. Faced with such incredible love and generosity from total strangers who knew not the family they were helping, the officers simply wept. He personally escorted the body back to Mexico, delivered the money to the fatherless family. With it, they buried their husband and father, and with the money left over, bought a tiny house and clothes and a chance at a new start. And that's not all. The town of Poughkeepsie sent a team to the village and learned of their needs and pledged to become a sister city with them to help all the villagers get on their feet. All because one detective didn't stick to the manual, didn't study just for the test, didn't accept the minimum. Laura Von Stratton, an advertising executive, was fast on her way to somewhere in New York City when she saw a man lying in the snow and another man leaning over him giving him CPR. She and a group of concerned folks gathered around, none of them knowing how to administer CPR, standing helpless watching the only man who knew what he was doing. The EMT unit arrived and took over, took the man to the hospital where he recovered. Laura went on her way. But she didn't go on her way because the old way was now unacceptable. She went on a different way. It was not acceptable to her that she and the dozens of others didn't know what to do. So she tried to find a way to learn how to do CPR and found it quite difficult to find a place where it was convenient to do it. And she said that was not acceptable. So she began to call around and eventually got hold of a, the mayor's office and talked to the right people who then talked to the right people. And they worked together to partner with a sports gym chain that opened up 28 of its branches for members of the New York Fire Department to come and offer CPR classes to folks all around the city, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people now know how to save a life because young woman said, well, you, one young woman said this was not acceptable. Love knows no minimum. That's what Pam Hahn discovered several years ago when she hated seeing what she was seeing, that too many kids, too many kids in beautiful Sarasota were going to school with no supplies, holes in their shoes, and no food in their tummies. 
This is not acceptable, she said. So she got her church to do a thing called Day of Hope, and they managed to pull together doctors and nurses and hairdressers and photographers and school supplies and backpacks and gift cards for clothes, and pretty soon a couple hundred kids were in better shape to start school. But a couple hundred kids in Sarasota County is a drop in the bucket, right? So more churches got invited and more churches got involved like ours, and more children now have shoes and notebooks and backpacks, and it's still unacceptable, right? Because the world is not right when even one child doesn't have what she needs to learn, to grow, to be what God wishes her to be. The family in our church discovered the challenge that people with mental health diagnoses have in making their way back into productive living, and they said this is unacceptable, so they started the academy at at Glengarry down on 41, close to Bee Ridge, a community that helps those who have struggled with mental illness to acquire job training and life skills and to find placement for employment in town. And, And people now are discovering a new chapter for their lives because someone said that the status quo is unacceptable. Love knows no minimum. Do we have to know this for the test? Wrong question. Because on this Palm Sunday, Jesus is on the move. He is on the move. He is saddling up his donkey and making his way into the city because he is busy fulfilling the law. He is about the long obedience of love. He's making his way to the next town where there are poor migrants and grieving widows and children with holes in their shoes and people with mental illness and men lying in the snow fighting for their lives. He is on the move, and maybe at the end of it all, there's a cross, but that's okay, right? Crosses mean you're doing something right, right? You are fulfilling the law. You're headed in the right direction. You've gotten the only question on the test that matters correct. You've been faithful to the voice that's been speaking in your head because love has no minimum. I would rather be ashes than dust, wrote Jack London, author of The Call of the Wild. I would rather be ashes than dust. I would rather that my spark should burn out in a brilliant blaze than it should be stifled by dry rot. I would rather be a superb meteor, every atom of me in a magnificent glow than a sleepy and permanent planet. The function of man is to live, not to exist. I shall not waste my days trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. Time to use your time. Time to look and see what needs to be done. Time to say that this is unacceptable. Time to saddle up your donkey. Time to head into the city because Jesus is on the move. He is fulfilling the law and he's waving to us to that long and abundant obedience of love to which he invites us.